I'm mad at you You're mad at me But uh, let's take the time Verbally Don't shut down Honey, where you're crowning Honey, where you're crowning Be the king I know you are I won't be little you You won't be little me I will both be pawns In our royalty No trouble Welcome. I'm delighted to be here again with you and have Ms. Artaska with us today. Um, we have a lot of music to get into. We are so excited to have her. I'm your host, Dr. Moshe Lewis, and this is a delightful artist with an incredible story. But first, our viewers really want to know, how did you get your name? It's so unique and it's so beautiful. And if I'm not mistaken, your birth name is actually Artaska Strings. No, oh yes, my birth name is actually Artaska. Um, I was named after my godmother and I would always ask her, well, where'd your mom get this name from? She said, I don't know, she's from Arkansas. She said, some lady here in Arkansas had this name. My mother loved it. And that's why my godmother was named that. And my mother, she, um, you know, she looked up to my godmother, I guess. So she named that. My original name was supposed to be Zion, but it's <laughs> Artaska, so yeah. Sure. And if I'm not mistaken, you became interested in violin uh, from the age of three, four by Yo-Yo Ma, nonetheless? That's yes. Amazing. Um, yes. When I was little, I was like three years old and I saw Yo-Yo Ma on, I think it was Sesame Street, and he was playing with this orchestra. So I was in the living room. My mother was in the kitchen. I ran into the kitchen. Mom, how do they hold that thing up? 
And next thing I know, when I had turned four, I was old enough to enroll into um, violin classes at my school. And that's basically how it got started. That is incredible. And this may sound forward, but our mm -hmm. just want to sort of understand the development of how you came up with your sound. Um, maybe just starting early in the beginning, what was something that you might play or that, that may have given you inspiration if, if our listeners can get a sample of your tickling those strings? Um, something that inspired me from back in the day when i was little i listened to a ton of songs and i was obsessed with movies and the soundtracks of movies and things so there was the preacher's wife that whitney houston was in um babyface kenneth edmonds is his name he wrote the entire soundtrack and i just love the sound i love the vibe and it was that and also i love diane warren um she wrote like every major pop hit back in the day so between those two, like I love the baby face, the smoothness of it. I like the big sound, you know, that Diane Warren had with her music. So that's how basically I got inspired. And though my early, early music career, like um, when I started off, I was outside. I started merging hip hop with the violin. And that was in the 2000s growing up. And then um, afterwards, I went to reggae, actually, reggae and Afrobeat. And it was like, it was just the sound of the time because of what was going on. And it just inspired me. And then I went to jazz. So, yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to completely smooth jazz, and I uh, I wish I could play a snippet of those songs. One, I actually love two of the songs. One is more smooth jazz, one is more funk, and that's something that I have done. Have I really done funk in a performance? I don't think I've really touched uh, funk yet mixed in with the jazz, but um, it's definitely 100% smooth jazz with a little funk in there um that's definitely where I'm going and I wish I wish I could play that right now um so I'm really excited about that and it's like finding yourself finding your voice and music and that's where I am that's where I like um I still like the songwriting process but I really really love that so basically pushing it to that level like really diving in I, I love you taking on the challenges. Your music is so amazing in that it's covering so many different mm -hmm. styles and, and blending them together and styles that we grew up with. Bootsy Collins, George Clinton, uh, man, I've been to over a dozen George Clinton. <laughs> um, and so uh, Parliament, I mean, the sound probably has been sampled more than any other artist. Um, mm -hmm. How do you stay positive? You have a lot of energy and you're very upbeat. Um, sometimes when things seem a little bit down or a little bit harder, what, what words of encouragement do you, do you have for our viewers? How do I stay positive? Well, um, I was always into, I started getting into meditation. Yes, I pray and, you know, I try to find time where it's silent and may listen to gospel music. That's what I grew up on. Um, but I really, really, really try to meditate, just find some time just to sit there and meditate. Um, that's, that's, that's the best thing I can do. Um, staying positive. It's like, okay, well, things happen. Um, we may not be able to control them, but what we can control is how we, you know, react to it. So, um, the best advice was given to me a long time ago. So something happened in music that I wasn't proud of. And they said, you know what? 
give yourself a day or two to be just really upset, mad, and dwell in it. But then after that day or two, you're only giving yourself two days, come out of it and, you know, get right back to it again. And 100%, <laughs> that's what I do. Um, and I try to be as upbeat as possible. It's something that I had to teach myself. That's something that I was not taught. So I had to just, it's something I'm continuing to be practicing, just smiling and just being positive, <laughs> looking for positive things, you know? Yeah, well, your music is so positive and uplifting and, and the amount of time energy you've put into it, it clearly comes across what's a good way that people can find um, your work and more about you and uh, continue to listen to the music that you're helping to create yes um you can go on my website artascastrings.com a-r-t-a-s-k-a-s-t-r-i-n-g-s.com on my youtube channel instagram and uh, facebook all Strings. Sure. Well, I couldn't let you go without asking you about that last name. That just certainly uh, may be a coincidence, but, but amazing that you uh, came to find the violin as your instrument of passion. Uh, how, did that, how did that come about? Um, finding violin is my instrument of passion. And the um, strings. I mean, that's an interesting uh, combination. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, the strings part, what happened was on social media, my name was Artaska. Um, and I, someone else took my name because their name was Artaska. They lived in another country. So I'm like, okay, what defines me? Strings, because I like to orchestrate things. And so then I put Artaska strings on there, and <laughs> that's what happened. I, I love it. It's great. As we sort of go out, just to, if you give us a, a piece that uh, is also, like you said, positive and, and uplifting. I think music is so healing to the soul during stressful times, during times of triumph, and also uh, during times of, of great pain. And it can certainly bring us so much solace as a, as a universal language. What's uh, some uh, music that you would like to uh, leave us with as, as we say goodbye to our viewers today? Um... The music that I would like to leave you guys with is, you know what? This is a piece that people told me that they like, and I like to thank you guys uh, for playing it and streaming it, that I was shocked. But I think Royalty, um, it's a vocal and violin piece that I did not think that people would pay attention to as such. And so, but I appreciate the feedback of it. So I'm going to play it and thank you. I am gold, stories and told. I am light, don't let the darkness build the night. You are queen, boo put your crown on the land and see. You are queen, boo put your crown on the land and see. Be strength, a pity me a man. He is a liar, no question of his mind. You are king, boo boo, put your crown on the land and see. You are king, boo boo, put your crown on the land and see. Royalty, we are royalty, royalty, you are royalty. So yeah, it was royalty.
Yeah, I, I love it. I think it sends out such a positive message, which is what you exude, I mean, throughout the interview and your music, and we can't have too much inspiration in the world. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we're so delighted again to have your Daska Strings with us. Your music is so uplifting, and uh, we appreciate just some moments behind the scenes of, of how you created it and put it together. And um, we look forward to your next album and to talking to you again. Thanks again so much. Thank you. Welcome to Mindful Stress Management, and I'm delighted to join you today to discuss tips to address anxiety, stress, and mental health um, during the current crisis with corona. My name is Dr. Moshe Lewis, and I'm joined by two esteemed guests, Ms. Terry Passero and Ms. Nina Passero, who will introduce themselves and talk to you a little bit about what they're doing in the field of mindful stress management. We wanted to bring this program to you today to address the unspoken needs that many times exists in a fast paced world where now we've been forced to slow down and really think about how we protect others and also how we act as good corporate citizens. We're aware that there can be a lot of stress that can occur when we face a challenge such as this where there's a lot of unknowns. So without further ado, Ms. Terry Passero, why don't you tell the audience what you do and a little bit about yourself. All right, thanks Dr. Lewis. Um, good to be here. And I'll say I'm so grateful to be doing the work that I'm doing right now. I've had my business, Mindful Stress Management, for about four years. And I provide workshops and one-on-one -on -one coaching for organizations to help them deal with people in those organizations, deal with overwhelm and stress. And so now more than ever, of course, there is such a great demand. And um, so my business has definitely uh, increased and I'm very grateful I can reach many people um, and, uh, and help where I can. Excellent. And I'm also joined by Ms. Nina Passero from the uh, Crisis Text Organization. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do there. Hi, um, yeah, I'm Nina Passero, uh, Terry's niece, as you can tell from the last name. Um, and I work at Crisis Text Line, which is a New York City-based organization, at least in the U.S. We have international partners elsewhere. Um, but it is a nonprofit that does crisis intervention over text message, as the name suggests. So you can text in um, at any hour, 24-7, um, with anything that you personally deem a crisis, um, ranging from suicidal thoughts to uh, doing poorly at your, your talent show or feeling stressed about coronavirus, obviously. Um, and you will be connected with a um, real human counselor on the other end to give you some suggestions and help deescalate the moment. So I work there on the product team, um, but I also take conversations when I have the time and speak to texters myself. Sure. We'll talk about keeping it in the family. That is really uh, inspiring that you are in New York, first of all, uh, in terms of at least uh, dr addressing some of the needs that exist. Um, and I realize, though, that you are uh, currently in, in California. So we appreciate your safety and, and um, the fact that you're with us today. Um, we're going to start off first talking a little bit more about the type of work we do and, and why we think this is so relevant. Um, I can certainly lead off and say that I'm still uh, seeing a very few patients um, who have to come in, usually just one or two uh, on a daily basis. And so we have to do screenings for those patients. And we think this will be a lot of the future as well. And uh, many of them are uh, needing a more personal ability to share um, some of what they're going through. Um, but in terms of what I'm getting on the phone, which is what most doctors across the U.S. are dealing with, we're hearing sort of literally from the front lines of patients who only may be sick for a few hours or for a few days, and they really need to find out if they need treatment, um, where they may need to get testing, and, and how they address their symptoms. There definitely is an anxiety component to this because so many people are hearing um, different messages as they evolve over time and we realize that the information is changing and so a lot of times I find myself trying to really sort of console and have people realize that they're seeing medicine in evolution and while we're used to that with our cell phones or other things that change over time we're not so expecting that with medicine we figure that the doctors will have the answers but the truth is that when it comes to this disease we are learning uh, something new literally every single day um, so with that, I'd like to turn to Ms. Terry Castro and, and tell me about what are some of the things that you may be seeing on the front lines or as you deal with clients uh, at the corporate level. 
Yes. Well, I think you point to a, a key word, which is uncertainty, you know, and the evolution of we don't really know what's happening. And so what's unfolding in terms of medicine is unfolding in terms of all of our lives. We are so uncertain about what's to come. Um, the structures that we relied on are not there or they have changed. And that makes us very an anxious, right? And um, so I'm working with that in organizations and helping people who were used to being to working together, right? Generally, um, working remotely and still being able to maintain a connection and collaboration with their teams when they're in the midst of a whole range, a whole spectrum of Im uh, impact from this coronavirus, from maybe they live alone and it's calm, but they're feeling really isolated and lonely. And those usual ways of connecting with people at the water cooler or having lunch together aren't there. Or perhaps they're on the other extreme and two professional parents are working and have, have children at home that they're also trying to take care of and educate or they have a sick uh, parent or a, you know, a friend or they're in the health industry. So just the range is so great. And um, I, I read something on, on Facebook recently and it was a really nice way to think about this in terms of being able to understand how people are going through this differently. That we're all in the same storm, but we each are in a different boat. And we truly are in a different boat from socioeconomic to race to, you know, where we live are so many factors. Um, so, so it's across, it's across the board, but I think in general, people are trying to find a new, a new normal, a new way to balance. And that's what I try to help people find that, that connection to how do we keep communicating um, not isolating, getting our work done, contributing, taking care of our health. That's a big part of what I work on is how do we take care of our physical health? How do we take care of our mental health? Um, and we walk through those things and not big things, but micro practices that people can just incorporate into their lives very easily because nobody wants any, another piece of a huge something dumped on them right now. Like you got to do this. Uh-uh, we are overwhelmed, rightly so, legitimately so, we are overwhelmed. So those ways that we can simply take care of ourselves in little ways is what I, I really focus on, because um, it's so important right now. Sure, and we're gonna delve into some of those strategies in a bit. Okay. Um, Ms. Nina, from your perspective, what you're seeing on the front lines, I know we talked a little bit about the types of texts that are coming through and some of the trending patterns that you all are noticing. What are, what are some of the details behind uh, some of the data you've collected and some of the trends that you all are noticing? Yeah, so um, our crisis text lines business model in the US and um, around the world, which we're in Canada, the UK and Ireland right now, and um, hoping to expand as the year goes on. Um, but the business model is uniquely appropriate for this crisis right now because, you know, we didn't have to shift anything. We have always operated online. Um, obviously, the employees who work in the office typically are working from home, but otherwise, it, you know, it's a volunteer run organization that everyone can do from their homes already. So we were really well equipped to deal with this. Um, and so we have seen a huge increase in both uh, texters texting in, but also in applications for volunteering, which has been really great to see. Um, and really awesome that people in such a stressful time for themselves individually are increasingly wanting to help others. So that's, that's pretty encouraging. Um, so we, like I said, we've seen a lot more volunteers and texters for the first time ever in the US only. We've had 7,000 monthly active counselors, um, which is the highest we've ever had. So we're seeing pretty record breaking numbers on both sides um, through all of this. Um, we've also seen increases in applications and texts from Asian American um, people who are responding to the racism that is sort of floating around because of this coronavirus. Um, they're being generally inspired to help and also to reach out for support, which is... Well, one of the first pieces um, of guidance that I offer people is to go easy on yourself, to really give yourself a break because we were under such duress. 
Um, so that's one thing. Be kind, be compassionate, be loving with yourself and with people around you, which can be really hard. It can be really hard right now. Um, and the, I want to say something about the brain because what when we start realizing how the brain is responding to this uncertainty in such a normal way and how we're being activated, it really helps like, oh, if I shift something, maybe I can impact my brain. So for example, the brain is hardwired for survival. So it's looking for ways that it feels threatened. And if it feels threatened, it activates the stress response, right? The hormones, adrenaline and cortisol, so that we can fight, flight or freeze. That's normal and we are pretty much in a very activated state of stress because we don't know what's to come we worry so we maybe have the tv on a lot so you know limit the amount of time that we're really listening to news we want to be aware but you know limit it to what's coming in limit who's coming in your living room you know via tv or internet um so the brain that's one thing about the brain that's really important so how can we interrupt that stress reaction so that we don't get in that heightened state. And a key piece is the breath. Because you know, think about a stressful situation. When you are stressed, we have very shallow breathing, right? Because we're breathing fast, our heart rate's pumping fast to get us ready to fight, flight, or freeze. So when we take an expanded breath and a slow exhale, it's sending a message to the brain, oh, my body is safe. So it starts interrupting that stress reaction and calming the system. A breath, an inhalation, slow exhalation. And sometimes it's not very deep and that's okay. Meet your breath where it is, um, but just start noticing. And so even that can start calming the system that then enables us to think a little more clearly, clearly and maybe not get too wrapped up into the worry of oh, what if, what if. We have to plan, but again, if we can calm our system, calm the body through breath, then we can start thinking about our thoughts and perhaps bring our thoughts back to what's working in my life now. And that's a really key question too, to identify what's working now. What can I appreciate now? Even in this moment, something in your room that you look around and you see and like, oh, I really, I appreciate that. That can break for and stay with it for a few breaths. And that can really help interrupt that stress reaction and bring a little calm. And we all need a little calm in the midst of the flurry. And then we maybe go back up and then we come back down to like oh, interrupt the stress reaction, come back up. So the breath is really critical. POP, I just want to introduce POP, which is stands for pause, observe, and proceed. So that's a practice you can do anytime when you're laying in bed at night and can't sleep, pause. Notice three breaths moving in and out of the body. Just notice you're breathing. About 20,000 times a day you breathe. So you notice you're breathing. Observe, what am I feeling? I'm you know, anxious, I've got tightness in my shoulders. You know, Whatever it is, bring your awareness to the body, to your emotions, to your thoughts. And then we proceed. So pause, observe what's going on, and proceed. And then just let go into the next step, which is whatever it is, sending an email, going to sleep. So pop stress now is um, kind of an E. I like it because it's an easy thing to remember. Pause, observe, proceed. And it can, you can do it like that, or you can do it in five minutes or 30 minutes. I like that. That is mm -hmm. Practical and straightforward. And um, as I was listening to you, I was trying to find myself too, slowing down and breathing. And on that note, as a provider, I can chime in that one of the things that I'm trying to do more, and I was trying to do it even as we're taping our show, um, and we so appreciate you doing that and providing this service um, to listen and to do reflective listening as we talk about in the field. I think as providers often, um, and even many times on the front line, or perhaps as a parent, we want to have the answers. And sometimes we do have to react quickly, as you stated. But, but pausing, and for me, I take that as slowing down a little bit to, to listen. Because so many times when we do get a complaint from a patient or from a client, it's that, well, I don't really feel that 
he was listening or she was listening or she heard me or um, also with a partner or a loved one. I don't feel like they hear what I'm saying. They may um, listen, um, but they may be so quick to offer solutions or so quick to try to resolve it or um, so quick to avoid it that they don't really hear me. So I certainly find uh, myself uh, doing that. And I think that may be something our, our viewers can, can take away in terms of uh, just taking those extra few seconds to, to listen and hear someone out. That's, um, so, that's so important. And if I can just interrupt there, we, the, our, most people's favorite topic is themselves. <laughs> so if we give people that space to talk about themselves and really listen with an open heart and real and watch when our mind wanders is like I'm bored or I want to do something else and come back to that person for a certain period of time and really give them our awareness like you're talking about it makes such a difference that connection is huge is huge and that relates to the brain again in that the brain is also wired for social connection we need each other. We've evolved because we have been able to rely on each other and collaborate. So we need that. So the listening is a part of that collaboration. What do you need? What am I hearing from you? How can we work together? It's so critical and something we can all, uh, you know, improve on, I believe. <laughs> We have yeah. two words in one mouth. Remember, that's what they say. For <laughs> we can't do it too much. Um, Ms. Nina, maybe some insights that you all have found at the um, crisis text line that you feel, gosh, these are common denominators or some pearls or tips that we give to our, our volunteers. And also just one little uh, clarification. If I'm not mistaken, some of your youngest volunteers are in their teens. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe you have to be 18. I should okay. fact check that. Um, I don't think you can hop on at any age, but yes, I mean, we definitely have people who volunteer from college um, all the way to, we have um, volunteers who are elderly people who, um, it's actually pretty amazing. There was an article, I'll find it after this, uh, but there was an article written about this um, one volunteer who spends a lot of time on the platform, who um, is an elderly woman who is talking to, I mean, a lot of our texters are young people. Um, we've seen the numbers go up. We've seen people um, who are a little bit older be texting in more during COVID actually, but um, typically uh, a big proportion of our texters are um, younger people, 18 and under. Um, and so it was really remarkable that this elderly woman had been counseling people who were, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, people who likely never would have asked for advice from a woman in her 70s or 80s and didn't know that that's who they were talking to. Um, and she's learning about what younger people are thinking about and terminology and stuff like that. And they're learning from someone who has, um, lived a lot more than they have and neither of them are aware of that necessarily but um it's pretty remarkable so uh, the service does pair up fairly unlikely people um and it works it goes to show that you know we all have something in common and you know sometimes removing the face in front of you uh, allows people to connect in that way which i think is really interesting so i'll find that article um i'm sure i didn't paraphrase it as well as they described it, but it's really interesting. Um, but yes, so our volunteers range in age quite a bit um, and also in experience. Some people, like I said, are students, teachers. Um, I'm sure many of them are actually unemployed now given the crisis. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds um, who share the training that we put them through in common. Um, but of course, everybody brings their individuality to uh, their conversations as well. Um, so it's, it's definitely very interesting. And in terms of um, some tips that we sometimes will recommend during conversations, um, it's important to remember that crisis text line is not intended for any sort of ongoing therapy. Um, the idea we say to take you from a hot moment to a cool calm. So you're texting in in a crisis about whatever it may be. And the idea is that by the end of your conversation, you have de-escalated a bit and you've gotten some of the care that you need. Uh, of course, you can text back in 24 seven, anytime. Um, but ideally some of the tools that you get in your conversation are things that you can rely on without necessarily texting in in the future. Um, so it obviously depends on the person who's texting in and uh, what they're going through, but you know, something that I, when I take conversations, send to 
most of the people is um, it's a breathing GIF that it essentially just shows like a, a, a circle opening and closing and it says inhale and then you inhale with it as it opens and then exhale and you exhale with it as it closes, which um, you guys have both mentioned the importance of breathing. Um, and so that can really help people. I mean, it feels, sometimes it feels silly to send when someone texts in with a really substantial life problem and you're like, look at this circle opening and closing, <laughs> it'll help. But it actually does, <laughs> it does help. So um, that's one thing. And we also uh, ask people individually, you know, what have you done in the past when you felt this way that has made you feel better? And if they don't have an answer for that, what do you do in general to relax or to have fun or unwind or anything like that? And sometimes people will say, I love to um, hang out with my dog or I, really like to draw or write or go on walks or watch Netflix <laughs> or um, anything like that. And so we will sort of take the lead from them and say, what do you think about going for a walk right now? Or, um, you know, in the case of COVID, it can be hard because a lot of the activities that we use to rely on aren't necessarily available to us. Um, so you can find alternatives or even sometimes just thinking about the time in the future when you will be able to do that thing can be helpful. So um, there's no one size fits all solution that we provide and also solutions, not even the right word, because that's not necessarily what we're providing. Um, but, you know, depending on the texter themselves and the sort of coping mechanisms they already rely on in their lives, our job is really to help them come to the own, their own conclusion about tools that many of them already have in their arsenal, um, that they can use in that moment, because sometimes that perspective is needed. You can't really see those things um, when you're thinking about your own life. So those are definitely some of the tools. Um, and we also, of course, have, you know, some people will text in dealing with the chronic illness and they're, <clears throat> even before COVID, have been unable to leave the house or um, so something like that, you know, reduced mobility. And so we'll send them a resource to maybe an online community of people who struggle with chronic illness where they can connect over their computer or their phone. Um, we will send them to uh, you know, resources that can help them connect to counseling services in their community um, that they can go to in person. So it's not just little things like the um, image that I mentioned, it's also sometimes tools that they can use on an ongoing basis um, after the conversation is over. Sure, well, I think any access to resources and, and even this tool and platform that you all have is so um, critical because it sounds so easy to access and the fact that it's available 24-7 um, really helps because I'm sure you may notice that there's a spike, especially if it's younger people, maybe later in the day or, or very, very late <laughs> in the day, um, uh, as far as maybe even early in the morning. Um, yeah, absolutely. That actually early. reminds me of one, um, one other thing is that we look very closely at the data that we get. <clears throat> Excuse me. We look closely at the data that we get about, um, I mean, in general, but we look at, at what times of days certain issues spike. Um, or days of the week. And of course we can look in the US specifically, we look across the country. So we'll know um, conversations about eating disorders spike on Monday afternoons generally across the country or um, stress increases at uh, in evenings on Sunday nights, which is something that most people know. So things like that have actually been used for from us to advise Schools, for example, you know, when they're thinking of programming around eating disorders, will say, hey, we actually generally see that concerns from um, students about this topic spike around this day. So maybe you want to plan your programming around then. So um, there's a lot that can be done that sort of you maybe wouldn't think of initially that can be done with the kind of data that we see coming in because the sheer volume of conversations that we're dealing with and people who are reaching out for help really creates like a huge data set um, of information that has previously been entirely unavailable. Um, so that's interesting as well. And that data is something that you can look at. We have a website where you can sort of toggle and see when certain things spike and where. Um, so I can be sure to link to that too, because if all else, it's actually just interesting to see. Sure, yeah. Wow, that's great. I didn't realize you all made it publicly available, so that's even even better. Um, one of the things I want to make sure we cover is sort of our even own personal approaches. It's easy when we have our professional hat to um, recommend, and I know for myself, 
Um, one of the things that I'm trying to do myself as well as with my family is something as simple as uh, going in the backyard and just uh, standing in the grass and um, just doing, as you all both alighted upon, uh, some breathing uh, just, just for a few minutes. I've been trying to get the kids into that um, as well. Um, we've done a few uh, meditation sessions. We've changed sort of where we go and where we walk. We're constantly trying to change up uh, where we're at in terms of uh, walking in a different direction, given the precautions. And certainly even that's something that could be performed on uh, in the house if one doesn't have a yard or grass access. Um, <clears throat> sometimes you know in big cities that may be a little bit more harder to access. So on carpet, uh, if you're in your bare feet and you close your eyes, it's amazing. It really allows the other senses to uh, take the information and and even if it's a different surface really just feeling it whether it's a linoleum or tile or brick or wood um, just really uh, having that connection so to speak uh, with the earth um, which is where it comes from and it's not certainly something that, that I came up with uh, many people do these meditative walks um, but I, I just find it so uh, simple and accessible and, and how about you we would start with Miss Terry what's something that you've incorporated in your own life or that you like to use to decrease stress well, well, thank you for that because I'm feeling my feet on the carpet as you talk. <laughs> it's very grounding. Okay. Yes. Um, so I, I'm, I do a lot of meditation. I'm doing more, um, you know, like formal sitting meditation, which just kind of helps build the muscle so that I can have mindfulness throughout the day, right? It's not just about sitting on that pillow. Um, but um, so that's, that's a, an important part for me. Um, also movement, movement, movement. I'm really trying to pay attention to how I can take care of myself, bring pleasure, you know, what's pleasurable for you, what's pleasurable for me. So for me, it's music is huge. I play the piano, I'm learning the guitar um, and connecting with friends, connecting with my mother who's in Ohio and I'm in San Francisco. So there's a real concern there for her health and, well-being um, and, and you miss Nina? um so I have been I mean I'm working still full-time which I'm super grateful for um, it's something that uh, I realize is such a privilege um, that most people don't have right now um, but that has been honestly I mean maybe that's sort of a boring answer but I've been really grateful to have work to keep me busy and keep a sort of you know semi-normal schedule going um, and I think actually that, uh, I mean, also I've found it helpful to take conversations on the platform, as I've mentioned, because I think, um, as Terry mentioned, there's so much pain and it all is sort of bizarre and <laughs> our schedules and our lives and everything are not as they once were. Um, and so it can feel really productive to talk to other people and help and try to use this energy and you can do it from your bed, you can do it anywhere. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> when you take a conversation, you do it on a computer. People text in from their phone, but the whole um, interface is uh, accessible by your computer. So you can just sit anywhere and take them. So I've been doing that. And I also find um, that for those of us who are not as lucky to have um, a work schedule that sort of can keep them sane and a little bit regimented, the you can schedule shifts on the crisis text line platform as well. So you can um, obviously, you're welcome to join at any time, but I think it could be helpful for those who are looking for a little more structure in their day to schedule a shift. They're in two-hour blocks. You can obviously stay on longer if you want, and if you need to run halfway through a two-hour block, that's okay. Um, but you can make that a part of your day or a part of your week where you know that, you know, on Sunday nights from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. or whatever time, um, you have a commitment and you're gonna go and you're gonna spend that time and set it aside. Um, and I think that that could be really helpful. It certainly would be for me uh, to create some sort of um, necessary uh, task that uh, is scheduled at a certain time for a certain time um, that you can be held accountable to. And like I said, the work itself also feels really productive and rewarding, um, at least to me and to the thousands of people around the world who are doing it right now. Um, so that is something that I really have been enjoying and grateful for during this wacky time. And reading. It's a great time to read the books that you have always said you would read and never would have otherwise. So read. 
certainly. Well, I, I know it's a, it's a very valuable resource and to those people, thank you. And we're grateful to all the people that are volunteering and giving of their time, uh, including all the extra time that you're putting in as well. So yeah, we wanted to really make sure that this program provided some useful tips, which I feel we tried to touch upon in terms of breathing, in terms of um, pop, uh, as Terry was talking about, in terms of a crisis line that's very tangible and something that's available 24 seven, um, and for which one can participate in as a, uh, a counselor advisor uh, by getting uh, treatment uh, or rather I should say training. And so I hope that these have really been a true, easy, accessible walk, so to speak, uh, metaphorically into how we think about uh, ways to deal with our stress. We realize that this is a very different time and that we're going into a post COVID world as they're calling it, um, where new emotions and new factors and a new way of interfacing uh, with each other um, and certainly with the world will probably certainly become a norm for quite a bit of time. And so um, while that also may be a little bit uh, stress provoking, I hope that some of the things that we touched on today uh, provide a very easy way. Some of them are free, some of them are very simple, and most of them are very doable. And uh, yeah, even with what uh, Ms. Nina said, yes, even getting back to some of the things that we know that we love, uh, whether it's listening to uh, music, as Terry said, or reading, um, these things are just so within our reach and so uh, wonderful um, because they allow us to explore other parts of our brain um, or whether it's just absorbing nature and being grateful um, and having an attitude of gratitude, as we like to say. So with that, I certainly thank uh, my esteemed colleagues uh, for uh, their time and reaching out to us uh, to be able to put this together. Um, as a final concluding, I just want to, for those that may want to hear, uh, how would they reach you uh, first, Ms. Terry, and then Ms. Nina, if they're trying to get in touch with you or your organization. Great, well, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, Easiest way to reach me is popstressnow.com. And then you can find my resources and videos, simple free guided videos I have on YouTube, I have on Instagram, little one minute reminders of just kind of how to touch in, how to take care of yourself. Um, so yeah, popstressnow at popstressnow.com. And Ms. Nina? Um, yeah, so I, like I said, will link the. Um, website and numbers that you can text in if you want to reach crisis text line directly um, you can apply to volunteer if you'd like at crisistextline.com um, or at the websites that i'll link for the um uk ireland and canada organizations um, and then if you want to reach me personally i can also link my email um, if you have any additional questions about crisis text line or, uh, you know, whatever books I'm reading, because I'm sure everyone's on the edge of their seat. So feel free to reach out. <laughs> um, and yeah, yeah. Check out the Ch crisis text line website. That's where you'll find most of the information. Sure. And I'm uh, Dr. Moshe Lewis. And just using my name, since it's pretty unique, uh, Dr. M-O-S-H-E dot uh, Lewis. Um, it's easy to reach me and, and find me and I enjoy being a, a resource and available uh, however I can assist. So again, I thank you all. I thank you all for watching. I thank you all for participating and um, we look forward to continuing to be able to serve. Treacherous. 